Larry assures me that it will. <laughs> um, and we are pleased that you're here. Sir Jennings are here. Um, and no, we're not late. We're just starting early. <laughs> we know that Parker has a dinner plan. <laughs> So tonight we have a special treat. In honor of Larry's talk, we have some new chairs just for him. Yeah. Yeah. So we hope your body parts enjoy it. Um, hi. So a few words um, on our talk tonight. We're, we're particularly excited about this, and it's great to see some new faces here tonight as well, and some old ones. Um, and so we'll hear a lot about a lot more about our namesake, Isa Redington. And but first, a few words about Larry. Larry the <laughs> third was born and raised in Waterville. He graduated from Waterville High School in 1988 and attended Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy, graduating with a degree in history, and earned uh, then a master's degree in education instructional slash program development in 2000. So we're lucky to have him here tonight. He has worked as a historical interpreter for the Adams National History Park in Quincy. Good evening, Mother. <laughs> and when he moved back to Waterville, he started working part-time at the Waterville Public Library and accepted a full-time position of Head of Patron Services in 2015. We're very pleased to have him here tonight to talk about Asa Reddington. Right. So, if anyone would like some water, we have a pitcher of water here and, and some cups. Would you like some? Okay. <laughs> I thought I'd just start out with kind of a bit nervous. It's been a while since I've really done a uh, speech in front of everybody, so uh, please forgive me if every once in a while I kind of stop to take a moment. But I want you to know I'm very grateful to be here tonight. Asa Reddington is one of my favorite heroes, and I cannot wait to tell you about him. Good evening. Tonight, I would like to speak to you on the topic of Asa Reddington. I'm going to tell you his story in his own words, or at least as much as I can. For Asa lived over 200 years ago, but we are so blessed to have his story from him in his own handwriting, that I'll have a copy of it, that he wrote a book on starting on January 1st, 1838, about seven years before his death, called Reminiscence. Boy, it took me a while to pronounce that one. A short sketch of the life of Asa Reddington. Before I start, though, and you've already heard a little bit about a lad that was born here in the city several decades ago, and yes, many decades it's starting to turn into, um, who was always fascinated by history. He found that there was so much to learn and how happy he was, but he was always a little disappointed in later life when he realized he passed by this house so many times and really did not realize what it was or the significance of what it is. And we were, uh, and as that lad continued to grow up, he also discovered that there are many things that we can find in our own community if we really look for it. Each generation adds to the continuing saga of what we call life. This lad was always amazed about how his life and the life of a community is told through the lives of all the people that live there. Some of these people before him were related, but others were not. Yet, they all came together to form a story of how we learn and improve each generation. And I think Waterville, by the way, is very famous for that. Um, no story is perfect, but all stories have a purpose. And more, and we'll learn more about that young man later. So let's begin the story of a man named Asa, who actually had a tragedy early in his life, but yet he would also, also is a reminder that each person can contribute and add to the story, no matter what the circumstances, to help a community grow and become a place to live and raise children. 
Asa Reddington, in his story, says that he was born in Boxford County of Essex, Massachusetts, on the 22nd of December, 1761. Now, you have to remind yourself of what's going on, or maybe what's not going on at the time. There was no United States. There were 13 colonies here, so there was no Maine. Most of Maine at that time was part of Massachusetts. So you can't, so even though I know he was not born in Maine, I like to think he's still one we claim is part of our own because of later on, and we'll talk more about that. Um, Asa Reddington, though, had one very interesting at the very beginning of his story that I really thought was something that we need to talk about for a moment. He had a grandmother named Hexabah Osgood Purley. And by the way, Hexabah, I love that name. She was a very interesting woman, lived well into her 90s. In fact, later, Asa would admit he wasn't even sure when she passed away. But Asa's grandmother told him one thing that he said, she said, I never want you to forget. And she said, remember my creator. Remember that each one of us were made by someone who cared for us. And even though there are times in our lives that we think that person, that God has forgotten about us, he has not. And she always told him to remember that he was a child of God. I thought that was very interesting for one of the first things that he wanted us to know about him when he was writing his book. Asa was born the son of Abraham, um, Reddington, and as far as he knew, his grandfather's name was Thomas Reddington. They resided as well in Botford and dwelled there. He was one of seven children. He was the um, his father married a woman named Sarah Kimball, and they had seven children: Thomas, Sarah, Asa, Aaron, Samuel, Chloe, and Hexabah. They grew up in Haverhill, uh, Massachusetts, where he moved there when he was about five or six years old. His father uh, was a man, his father was a man who would uh, love the sea and built a vessel about, was about 50 or 60 tons, which sounded a lot to me, but actually I'm told it's actually kind of smaller when you really look at it, but I just heard the word tons and that was for me. But he would travel back and forth. Asa often reminded himself um, that he liked to travel with his father. Um, unfortunately, it's going to get cut short, but um, he did remember going to at least one place in Portsmouth with his father. His father was the kind of one, and back in those days when you were a sailor, you would get your cargo, you would sell the cargo, you would get the money that would have, and then you would bring it back to your family. And of course, his wife is back home in Haverhill. Um, unfortunately, at the age of eight, a tragedy happened to poor Asa. You got to know that his mother was pregnant at this time. He was about eight years old, and he was brought back the news that his father had drowned at sea. It was very tragic. Uh, the story goes, according to the one survivor of this, that in the month of December, the vessel struck on a sandbar in the evening. And when the weather was very cold, uh, it kept going up near it was kept going up near the shore, but the uh, three people, which one was Ace's father, on the ship was a little worried. So they decided to get into a lifeboat. Unfortunately, the sea was very rough, and it could not make it to, um, even though they were very close, to land. In fact, it was said that the inhabitants seeing them in distress collected on the shore, made fires, but the sea was so rough it seemed that they could afford no relief. And unfortunately, the small boat was tipped over and Ace's father and one of the gentlemen were drowned. The other one did survive. This is a very tragic event. It would be a very tragic event in anybody's life. But I also remind you, it's even more tragedy. For all the money that Ace's father had at that time, for again, he put money into his boat and then he would be paid. And it came to about, Ace has said about 900 American dollars today, which would be a good sum, which I'm sure would be a lot more for back then, was with the father and it was never recovered. So now, not only is Ace's father died, but his mother, who's pregnant, has six other children. And of course, back then, there was no real way to take care of, no kind of aid that would be really there. And so she had to do something that we all would dislike. She had to basically give her children, the older ones, on set for the baby, which she had a few months later, she basically gave up to different relatives. It's a very sad situation. 
Asa often talked about, though, that he later in life would meet some of these brothers and sisters. In fact, one of them was Thomas. He would become close to. They would move to Maine together, and they would do some ones together. But this family was never truly back together because of this tragedy. But Asa always said that we need to keep moving on. So Asa, um, after the death of his um, father, um, first went to his maternal uncle. And between 1770 and 1776, he would go to his paternal uncle, Isaac Remington, in Haverhill, Mass. He also spent a year with his paternal aunt and uncle. Uh, after a year, he would move on to Mr. Goodwrench in Boxford. He moved again to reside with his maternal aunt and uncle, uh, Rebecca Kimball and Moses Putnam. He always said he had his best time with them. Unfortunately, they went through some financial difficulties, losing their selling, having to sell their farm, and so he had to move on to labor um, with a man named Stephen Putnam. <laughs> Stephen Putnam lived in Danvers, Mass. And um, the best that Asa said he could say about him was he was a hard master and a very stingy man. <laughs> the only thing about him that he said he can remember was that he said he lived 100% life, half starved and half needing clothes most of the time. So he was not overly happy with him. Luckily for him, though, his aunt and uncle, Richard Kimball and Moses Putnam, in 1776, um, moved to Wilton, Mass, and they started another farm, and he was able to finally go with them. Now, I've mentioned a whole lot that's going on in here. you got to know, this is only happening. He's only about 16 years old at this point. So he has had a lot of tragedy, no real place to call home, but yet he knew there was something that he wanted to be a part of this world. Now, 1776, for those of you who don't know history, shame on you, <laughs> is when the revolution is started. Asa Reddington was always wanted to know what is going on, because after all, just like even today, soldiers, ones that you want to be a part of, you want to be a part of this new adventure. Can you imagine, now I know we have a lot of problems today, but can you imagine that a country that's not even there yet, a country they're talking about, a country that could be to go from the greatest empire of its time. Take a look at Great Britain. It had at its time was stretched all over the four corners of the world, as they like to say. Had the biggest navy. So when these 13 colonies decided to say, it's time that we need to find ourselves. I think that it, we sometimes forget how much we deserve to give them credit. It was not an easy. And Asa Reddington is 16 and a half years old, but he said, I need to be a part of this. So at the age of 16 in June of 1778, Acer enlisted in Colonel Stephen P. Buddy's New Hampshire Regiment. And they joined, uh, they joined the Continental Army at Providence under the command of John Sullivan. So a 16 and a half year old boy. I don't know if you can imagine this. I do understand ages were a little bit different then. People didn't live quite as long. But can you imagine being a 16 and a half and deciding that you wanted to join this new possible country because there's no guarantee it will work. And remember, history is always written by the winners. So if they didn't win, they would be traitors. So we always have to remind ourselves of that. And he had no way to know the future at that time. So I give him a lot of credit that he wanted to be a part of this. The regiment quartered at Providence College where he took his first degree in what he called the science of war. Not an easy time for him. Um, not only did you have to learn basically to load muskets and kill people, but you gotta remember he had no person who could sponsor him, so he literally started out at the lowest time as a private. Not a bad thing, but the problem was is that um, a lot of times the, let's just say they weren't always set up well getting food and even sometimes ammunition. You had to have people get it to you. In fact, sometimes your relatives were the ones that did it. So Asa had a bit of a time with this. But he continued on. Asa, from August of 1778 to August 9th, uh, was with the Continental Army. He marched to attack the British in Rhode Island. Asa crossed over a Hollows Ferry in the island, and he and his regiment encamped four miles from Newport. From August 10th to the 13th, 1778, a violent rain and windstorm overtook the area about three days, ceasing all military activity and crippling ships. 
Asa witnessed the French fleet under General Charles Hector, who had a wonderful title that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, engaged in the British in the siege of Newport. Of this battle, Asa declared, I witnessed nothing equal to it during the whole war. So you have to imagine this 16 and a half year old, soon to be 17 year old boy, watching this battle that is going on. And in his mind, he never saw a battle quite like that. Can you imagine that, seeing the ships firing back and forth at each other, hoping that your side would win? In August 13th to September of 1778, Ace's regiment besieged Newport. Continental Army General Sullivan abandoned the Enterprise and returned to the upper end of Rhode Island, where, as Acer described it, a severe action took place. Acer's regiment was ordered to take post on the ground of the battle at Quaker Hill, where he was posted as a sentinel. His company fled the area under cannon fire, resulting in many casualties and in injuries. Acer saw many men wounded and killed. He himself experienced a near miss when retreating with his regiment. A cannonball struck the ground a few feet behind him and threw up such force that Asa was thrown to the ground. His later said, friends said some of Asa's fellow soldiers believed he had surely been killed. But Asa picked himself up and returned to his place in rank, for that's what he was taught in the science of war. You returned and you kept fighting. But I think that is quite the story. And then in 1778 to September to December, Asa was taken to East Greenwich and then marched to South Kingston. He guarded um, the shore until the middle of December. And then in December 1778, Asa marched to Providence, Rhode Island and was discharged. Why was I so trying to tell you the dates? You do realize this has all taken place in a one year period. This 16 and a half year old boy, now 18, almost 18, has been in battles, has been fighting, almost killed, has been marched around, and by the way, remember, no Humvees, no cars, marched literally around, and yet he realized that there was something happening here. He decided not to re-enlist right away, for he went back to his aunt and uncle in Wilton, New Hampshire, where we lived with them until about June 1779, or at the age of 18, after experiencing all of this, Asa said, I'm going to re-enlist. And that is what he did. And he went on at the age of 18 to have his second enlistment, where he joined the army at Pink's Hill on the Hudson River and served there until the middle of November. You'll find that Asa's regiment marched to Danbury, Connecticut, where they had halted by tremendous cold and deep snow. I love what he says in there because there are some things that I always say don't change. And he said the only thing he remembers about those months is that it never seemed to stop snowing. <laughs> it got deeper and deeper and deeper. So Asa decided that uh, by early spring of 1780, they were once more on the move, and he became part of the regiment under Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Moulton, and he marched to the lines between the enemy post on York Island and the American Army. As a part of the regiment's patrol, he continually guarded at a large open space of country. Now, oftentimes when we're thinking of soldiers, we're thinking of them hiding behind. If you've seen the land out there, I'm told, it is quite open space. So basically, your hope was that you would march, be able to shoot, had to reload, and then shoot again while the other enemy soldiers did not shoot at you. And Asa was quite the uh, marksman for that, but he often said that it was very scary. In fact, I wanted to read you something from his um, remnants that he said always bothered him for the last of his life. For although, he says, at one of the battles he got no sleep for two nights, one of his jobs was to watch the wounded men the night after the action. They were taken into a large house, the lower floors of which were covered with these poor fellows. Young men who had all been shot, as you know, not exactly hospital, not a lot of medical one, and basically they would try to get them to a place where they could at least help them. Each man was so badly off that they could not even put them in a wagon for fear that they would, the bumps would um, kill them. So they had to be carried. Twelve men agreed to do this, and they shifted on and off, carrying these bodies because you never leave one behind. And they had to go over eight miles to a place called Dobbins Ferry. 
Uh, one of these young men, though, Asa got to know. Asa was very sad because he knew he was shot through the body and probably would not make it. He was a young man, he appeared to be a fine fellow and belonged to General Washington's lifeguard. And we're going to talk, by the way, more about this lifeguard, but it's a very important position. But sometime, you've got to shoot and you've got to be a part of the battle. The day was very warm and he had to rest often under the shade and a fan him with small branches. So again, they're marching over eight miles with these wounded ones. It is so hot out. I mean, we all know what it is to have some heat. Can you imagine how uncomfortable and to be wounded. Um, he talked about greatly, he lamented, uh, this young man greatly lamented his fate. He belonged to New Jersey, and he said that he, he wished now he had minded his mother. So remember that, <laughs> said, son, I did not listen. <laughs> For she had told him that it probably was a dreadful decision, but he said that he needed to do that. And you'll find that Acer, Oh, sorry. Asa, my men are coming home. Asa um, <laughs> said that many men died, but he actually did make it the eight mile one. And the young man, though, turned to him, and his last words he heard him say was, It will be my turn next. Uh, after Asa left, he found out a few days later that this young man did end up dying. And he said, What a dreadful thing war is. So Asa, though he did believe and did what he felt that he needed to do when it came to helping this country, was never happy about all the war and all the destruction that had to happen. But we need to remind ourselves, and I like this story because it's a reminder that yes, this young man may not have won many battles, this young man was shot, but yet he gave his life so that one day we can have our freedom today. And I don't say that just simply to sound patriotic. I think sometimes we forget that these people all had a part of the story. And I don't want to forget this young man as part of this story. Well, in July of 1780, oh, as early spring finally came upon, um, Asa Reddington finally was on the move again, and he said that he patrolled and guarded more of the open country than he ever really wanted to. But in July of 1780, Asa's regiment surprised and cut off an enemy guard, uh, an enemy guard capturing a Captain Ogden and 22 prisoners. And he served as one of the guards that took the prisoners to West Point, about 30 miles away from York Island. The prisoners were safely delivered to Major General Robert Howe on his headquarters at Robinson's Farm near West Point. He felt that this was very important because he said, even though there was a lot of anger, he, the regiment made sure that all 22 prisoners, though I'm not sure going to jail at West Point being held captive is the much better, but he said all of them made it there alive. And after some of the experiences like this, I think that says a lot about him as a character. Asa returned to West Point and was discharged from the Continental Army for the second time in July 1780, in the year, and in his year of service was complete. At the age of 18, now he's fully 18, so another year has gone by, he, Asa returned once more to the farm of his aunt and uncle in Wilton, New Hampshire. Some of you are probably thinking, boy, all of this, 18 years old, the story should stop here, right? And he should finally get on? No. In March of 1781, Asa enlisted a third time into the Continental Army uh, in the town of Wilton. It, had it was called upon to furnish nine soldiers for the Continental Army to serve, this time, three years. So basically, he's going to serve one more year than he has for his two, to make five. But the town agreed to really pay him well. They were going to give him 20 head of young cattle at the end of the three years, and he was going to make $40 a month, which for him was quite a lot of money. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth, and he admits it, it never really happened quite that way. <laughs> Unfortunately, money was not always there, but Asa said that he had agreed to do the three years, and that is what he did. Asa served and took part in many battles and was employed to take cannon to Yorktown, arriving on October 1st. Now, for those of you, again, who know the history, and you should know the history of the Revolution, Yorktown was the last famous battle. This is where General Cornwallis, the head of the English army in America, was, and this is where the help of the French fleet that we finally was able to corner them. Asa Reddington was there. 
He took cannon there. The battle took place, and it was not something that they won overnight. The siege took place from October 1st to October 17th, 1781. And Asa took part in the siege. Now again, imagine yourself not knowing at this time, but this is the battle. You know you have to win it. You have the English general here, and you have the French, who are, by the way, on your side, thank goodness, fleet that's outside. You needed to win. And he said he was amazed, but they did. Asa witnessed the formal surrender of General Cornwallis to General George Washington and his allies, the French. Of this sight, Asa wrote this. This was a gratifying sight to me, for I have got quite tired of such business after all of these years. And according to Asa, by the way, and I think, and I'm hoping it's true, the song that was played during the surrender ceremony was, the world has been turned upside down. So it is quite the one for him, and I believe Asa. So Asa then continued his service, though, because remember, he's still got to serve some more time in the Continental Army. Now, a little bit of world history for you. You'll find that on September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was formally signed with Great Britain under the leadership of its chief negotiator, John Adams, um, who later became first vice president and second president of the United States, that formally ended the Revolutionary War. The United States was formally recognized. So do you realize what this means in the meantime? We are now a country. We are now formally part of this. Asa was more than thrilled. In fact, he was noticed because he was raised to the rank of corporal, and from June 16, 1783 to December 20th, Asa served as the to the Commander-in-Chief's Guards. Remember those elite guards we were talking about earlier? He was made one of them. And one of his dude, he was one of the 12 honor guards who escorted General Washington to Mount Vernon. Now some of you are probably thinking to yourself, oh my, what a fun time, you know, traveling with a general. I'll, you know, he's a corporal. But think about this. It was like a wild party. There was no greater hero than George Washington. And then to be his guard, to know that you were keeping him safe, for I do know that the war is formally over, but we also know the British still have a little bit left yet to fight in them. So he took this on, and nothing made him happier, he said, than when he finally got to Mount Vernon. But people were welcoming. Um, he was still trying to figure out what he wanted to do in life, but on December the 23rd, 1783, Asa was discharged for a third and final time, by the way, from the Army of the United States at West Point. Um, again, uh, he went back to his aunt and uncle in Wilton, New Hampshire, and again, I laugh because it's just about January 10th, 1784, he says, and of course, the snow seemed deeper. <laughs> more and more snow. So you see, that just never changes in life. <laughs> um, Acer eventually moved in 1784 to Salisbury, New Hampshire, where he was hired for six months as a laborer for Mr. Greenlee. Um, uh, Greenlee, sorry. Unfortunately, Remember that $40 a month and those 20 head of cattle? Didn't quite work out as much. He did receive some of it, but you'll find that it uh, didn't quite work quite as much out for him because the army at the time didn't have it, but he'll make good on that later. Um, you'll find that he worked, though, for a big wage. Are you ready for this? $6.67 per month. So basically, he had room and board in that, but it really is a good sum of money for back then. But Asa knew that there was something more that he wanted to do. Asa left New Salisbury where he found his brother Thomas, who we hadn't seen in seven years, for Portsmouth, and then embarked on a schooner eastward, leading into what we would call the Cassett Maine. Why is he doing this? Well, you have to remind yourself, the original colonies at that time were pretty much with their own governors, their own um, people there. And I recently learned also when we were doing one with the Levine family, that part of the reason they came up to me, and they said did too, was because there wasn't much taxes up here, because there wasn't very many people here. After all, if you start a business, even back then, you had to pay a certain amount. And he found that it would be a lot easier to go to this new place. But can you imagine going to this um, place, by the way, still part of Massachusetts, but still living in this new wilderness where there's not a whole lot around, little tiny villages where you can maybe do something big. And this is what Asa wanted to do. Asa traveled um, 
too. That's a girl, Maine. And believe it or not, he actually didn't become a merchant at first. I thought it was rather funny. For in 1784 to 1785, Asa was asked by a man named John Getchell and uh, his brother, Captain Ann Je um, Getchell, for a uh, winter to be a school teacher. He earned eight dollars a month. Who we? That's pretty good. <laughs> and he had, by the way, he's a raise from the six, sixty-seven. So um, he had over thirty scholars. Regarding the wealth and achievements of his students, Asa stated in his diary, "It's the opinion of the employers made out. No, oh, they made out pretty well. So see, all of our student ones. And I thought I was far from being qualified for the purpose. He later quit, though. When he left, he said, and it shows you the low state of learning." in this region in this period. <laughs> Asa liked to always talk about his basic books were the Bible. He also read the Psalms, but he really didn't have much beyond that. He knew how to read and write, and he knew how to use some arithmetic, but I thought it was interesting. So you see, schools are always having some problems. But Asa decided school teaching wasn't where he wanted to be. So Asa traveled back and forth from Maine and New Hampshire, purchasing with small amounts of money that he learned uh, that he did all the way, goods and land and shipped, and he would board in Bassaboro, Maine. Now, people sometimes wonder, even now, why would anybody board in Bassaboro? That's not making fun of Bassaboro. Bassaboro's a beautiful little city, but why would he do that? Well, of course, he met somebody. The Getchell family had a daughter named Mary Getchell. And he fell deeply in love with Mary. And they were, would be married on September 2nd, 1788. And they would also be the parents of nine children. Eight, yes. <laughs> Eight, well, you know, long winters. Anyway, Asa Jr. Samuel, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Asa Jr., moving on. Asa Jr., Samuel, um, Silas, William, Harriet, Mary, George, Isaac, and Emily. All of them born in Vassaro, except the last few that were born in Winslow, Maine. So Asa and he always loved his wife, and we're going to talk a little bit more about her later. But this started for the first time in his life. They purchased a home in between the years 1791 and 1794, and it would be the first time that he had a home, a family, and a woman that he loved that he could be with. He also had his brother with him, Thomas, and you will find that uh, his business interests and activities would range from lumbering to farming to fishing, as well as surveying land. Asa built his first home in Bassaboro, but he would later sell it. So we're talking about a man who finally felt like he had something. But even with all of these businesses, he wanted something more. One of the hardest problems, or oh, one of the greatest assets, sorry, in me, is the fact that they have the Kennebec River and many other and water ones that work through there. But the problem was, you had to have what you called water rights back then. You had to be able to control it. Because remember, no electric power, and if you wanted to make things run, you had to use water power. And um, he decided that they needed a mill. So he talked with his father-in-law. He also raised some money, and they decided in May of 1792 that they were going to buy some uh, a waterway um, at the Tychonic Falls on the Kennebec River, and they were going to build a sawmill and, and a dam. Now you got to remember, nothing else is up here. This is the first one that's going to happen, in fact, and this would be completed in August 1792. The sawmill and the dam were finished, being the first built in this area. But it's more than just simply seeing this sawmill. This sawmill means that lumber can be brought back and forth, can go upriver. This is also means that they have some control, and this is what's going to help make the state grow. So Acer not only helped out um, his wonderful uh, community, I mean his family, as they're but also with the community, for they are now growing. Um, Asa would later, in 1799, on good terms, dissolve his partnership with his father-in-law, but he kept one-third ownership, selling two-thirds of it, so that that way he didn't have to run at all the time, but could help with the profits, and I thought that was really good. 
Um, Asa Reddington would continue on. He is going to try to do many businesses, helping his family, but another tragedy happened on December 8, 1804. Asa's beloved wife had just given birth to their last child, Emily, uh, Mary, and all of a sudden she started not feeling well about 20 days later. He said in his uh, one, he did not even realize what uh, anything was wrong, and on December the 8th, 1804, his wife Emily died after about 20 days after the birth of her child. She had not left her room after the birth of Emily. Um, he did not think it was dangerous for two or three days. There, this was a dreadful stroke to him. He didn't have a stroke, but I mean, it was dreadful to him, the idea that he had lost his wife. And by the way, nine kids, baby upward, not always easy to also think about. His mind, he said, was unprepared to meet it. He he was not sure and he had not even realized the great loss that he had sustained until he looked into the eyes of his children and realized they would never get to see her again as well as him. But he said, I can only find, um, I can only be consoled in the holy religion in which I have been taught by my grandmother. That venerated woman who believed that from the moment of infancy all the way up to the um, one that we should be reminded ourselves of the divine being for grace and mercy that my sins might be pardoned through this Christ and that he would give the blessed influence of his Holy Spirit. And that peace of mind which this world could not give nor take away nor with any humble intercession offered up in vain for God was very great to me, even at this time, far beyond what I was able even to ask or think. My situation was lonely in the extreme. Not only was I left with nine children, all of them being, as it were, mostly in their infancy, and greatly needed care of a mother. He would later find one of his sisters, uh, his wife, who would come and help with these children. But he often said the only thing that got him through was that. So remember, it really is okay to have a belief that there's something greater than yourself. Can you imagine, again, losing your wife having almost nine little children? I think it says a lot about Asa that he got through this. He also was, in May 6, 1837, about two years later, because you knew it was going to happen, nine little kids, he found a widower by the name of Hannah Hobby, and she would become the second Mrs. Reddington. And he always said that she was truly a gift from his God. His children had a mother who loved them. He and she never had children of their own, but she did have two children from her first husband, and they raised them all together. And he was very happy about that. Later in life, she too would also die of all of a sudden. And he said, I felt bereaved, yet I had a great course of faithfulness to God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, that she continued with me for so long and was such a great blessing. So sometimes it's always easier to see the fact of not what you've lost, but about what you have. And I think Asa is a person who definitely needed to, uh, is a reminder of that. So as Asa continued on in his life, as he's getting older, he started thinking about his children, his grandchildren, and what was going to happen. Um, it's going to be in 1814 that Asa had constructed for his son William the home that would become the Reddington Museum, or where you are today. This home was built for a son, and um, I think it's very interesting. Asa did, by the way, if you ever get a chance, have a will. And in his will, he mostly was worried about and trying to make sure that each one of his children were taken care of at that time. And again, with nine, that was a lot. Asa also started thinking about history. Asa started also thinking about what's going, and that is why he started the book that he started. He was asked to remind himself of all of this and what was going on. Asa also had the privilege with his son Samuel and William to also erect a second, a flour mill, with four run of stone. So again, you have to imagine this. You now have a flour mill. I don't know if you guys have ever seen what one of these looked like. Great big blocks. They would go over. You would usually have some kind of animal, but sometimes it was people do, and would really make these ones move. From this, though, this mill, um, you can get wheat, you can get corn mash, things that you needed to eat and to use. And Asa was very privileged. But you'll notice he did this with his sons now, so that, that way they could also carry on what's going on. 
Asa started, when he started his book, I think it's very interesting. You can read, he starts on his ventures, and he obviously wrote it over um, a year, uh, more than um, seven years. By the end, though, he kind of stops writing about his life, and he starts writing more about his children, what happened to them, their numbers, who they are. Um, and it is very interesting to be able to read that. Um, in fact, there's a little quote in there, and it must have been written, I believe, by his son, who said, oh, by the way, I believe, oh, by the way, this was written um, uh, five years after Asa died. He said, I believe your grandfather did die on March 31st, <laughs> 17, uh, 1845. So you will find that, again, this book was really considered a major part of history. Asa Reddington is going to die in 1845. He would be, as we would tell, um, own lots of property around us. Most of the land that was up here later would be sold off by many other generations. But Asa also instilled in his family that they needed to do and work for the community. For instance, Acer's son, Acer Jr., by the way, was the Secretary of the Treasury for the State of Maine. And you'll find, by the way, there is a portrait, and I'm sorry, I meant to have a copy of it, because there is no one of Asa that we know of, so we really don't know what he looks like. But I like to think he is fathered, he looked at, uh, like, so if you ever get a chance to see that portrait, it at least can give you some idea of that. You'll also find that Asa's daughters and granddaughters had quite a life history. I'm not going to get into the full story, but you've got to hear the one about the one that married a count who turned out not to be a count, <laughs> had a lot of money problems, and was mostly put away. Quite the story. But you also find there are some really good things. That one of his uh, grandchildren is going to marry into the family of Hewlett Packard. So they are definitely well connected. What does all of this all come to? When I read over this story, the one thing I took from it was the little boy, remember him I was telling you about, suddenly realized he had traveled everywhere from Massachusetts to New York to Florida to somehow find his place. And he was never quite sure about what it is. After all, you think of George Washington, you think of all the other great leaders when it comes to um, our country. But do we ever think of the person who simply wanted to make the community better? Isn't that really what we all can do and we can really learn from Asa? When that young man came back here to Waterville, Maine, he was very, very interested in, like, what is he going to do? He liked history. He had just got done, if you haven't figured out it's me, uh, working at the Adams Historical Park, and he wasn't quite sure if he would ever be able to do that again, uh, be able to enjoy his job. And then he got a job at the library. Yes, I'm promoting the library. For every community <laughs> needs to know, their library is a place where we can learn history. Wonderful plaque there we have to celebrate, by the way, Asa being in the Revolution and all those other ones. But I also want you to know that it's also a place where you can be you, where you can discover information, where you can be the person that you really want to be. And I also need to thank one person in here, a certain director who I won't name name. Names, Sarah, but I just want you to know when she smiles at you and says, I know you can do it, you know you can. And I'm very grateful for that. This is what we can be to everybody. This community is about what Asa wanted, to be able to grow, to be able to be, and yes, it's not perfect, and there are some things that you can name that you may not like, but I challenge you to also name the things that you do like, and you may be amazed at what you'll find. As we start to end this, I wanted to do a couple of things. One, Asa Reddington carried a flintlock musket during the time of his service in the Continental Army, including the Battle of Yorktown. His gun was a faithful friend to him during the battles, and despite being quite feeble and suffering from injuries and battle fatigue, Asa was determined to get his musket home at the end of the war. Asa made a deal with a fellow soldier to carry the musket home to New Hampshire from New York for him, and in return, Asa would pay the fellow one dollar or the musket. Upon arriving home, Asa worked eight days to earn one dollar to redeem his musket. Asa kept the musket for the rest of his life. Asa's grandson, William Solomon Keith, wrote a song about the musket just before the siege of Yorktown in the U.S. Civil War. He dedicated the song, The Corporal's Musket, to General George McCollum. Keith was killed at the Battle of Gaines Mills in 1862. And a copy of the Corporal's Musket included sheet music can be found at the U.S. Library of Congress. So you see, 
quite interesting. Um, some of this is legend, but I still love it. And by the way, legend can be true too, even if it may not be. But a local <laughs> legend, and you may have heard this, claims that Asa Reddington was buried in the city cemetery across from the library, which would now be the park, all right, upon his death in 1845. Later, it would be turned into a park, and in 1851, all the bodies were supposedly moved to the Pine Grove Cemetery, which was opened on Grove Street. The bodies and the tombstones from the city cemetery were brought to Pine Grove over the next decade. But according to tradition, now this is tradition and legend, Asa um, said, if my body is ever removed, and by the way, how he would ever know this, I don't know, <laughs> but if my body is ever removed, I will curse these, this uh, place and I will walk around. Like a Shakespearean story, Asa placed that curse there on his grave. Some said that he was actually, the body was left there, but you will find there's quite a nice monument to him in the Pine Grove Cemetery. So if you have a chance to go down there. But the question becomes, is he really buried there? <laughs> Who knows? But I still like the idea of him having that. So as you start to think about tonight, I hope you walk away from here knowing that a man named Asa all tried to make this community a little bit better, a little bit more business-like, and sometimes had to make decisions that was not always his happiest but he did it because he cared. And I think Asa Reddington deserves a hand for all that he has done. <laughs> so, let us remind ourselves, we can all have a little of Asa in us. Is there any questions anybody have?